Greetings, loyal listeners and new recruits. I'm Drew Deach. I'm Travis Newton. And this is Genre Vision. Every week, Travis and I review and recommend horror films, action movies, fantasy flicks, sci fi cinema, and more. And we are continuing our month of Lith Going, Lith Gone, our celebration of John Lithgow with Harry and the Hendersons, that Bigfoot movie from the 80s. Before we get into that, we have a couple calls to action. We have some new patrons that we would love to thank. Patches and Luke have become patrons over at patreon.com slash genrevision. And now Patches and Luke have access to all of the additional bonus content that we make for Patreon, which uh, includes weekly pre-shows that we do. We just recorded one for this episode about uh, cryptids and Bigfoot, which which led to one of the uh, funniest moments so far in the pre-show history. Patches and Luke both signed up for the $5 a month premium subscriber tier on patreon.com slash genre vision and it affords them all the goodies that drew has described uh, in addition to all the finflix goodies that we do it's true so if you're interested in that go to patreon.com slash genre vision and sign up and you can be as cool as patches and luke the only other thing for call to action this week is if you love what we're doing here please rate and review the show on the Apple Podcast Store. We say it every week, and I'm sorry to sound like a broken record, but it really, really, really helps us out. Yes, if we get enough reviews uh, within a short period of time, we run the chance of appearing on you know promoted pages within the Apple Podcast Store, and that could increase popularity drastically for the show. So please, if you want to see the show uh, expand and, and reach more ears, Reviewing us and rating us on the Apple Podcast Store is one of the best ways to do that. You can do it from your Mac. You can do it from your PC with iTunes. You can do it from your iPhone, your iPad, what have you. Just uh, know that it counts for a lot. So thanks in advance. So we are continuing our month of John Lithgow movies with Harry and the Hendersons from 1987. This is one of those movies that I, I, I somehow never saw, which is kind of crazy because it feels like it was a movie that was always on television or I always saw coming up on the preview channel, uh, you know, summary. And it was certainly a movie I was very aware of, but didn't have a whole lot of interest in it. And both Travis and I have uh, have seen it for the first time for this show. And there were certainly things going into it that we were excited about. Obviously, John Lithgow, which we're you know celebrating this month. Uh, but a big part of it was that, hey, it's a Bigfoot movie. And the Bigfoot is going to be played by Kevin Peter Hall, who most people will probably know as the performer who did the Predator in the original Predator. A uh, number of other roles and a phenomenal uh, you know, suit actor and you look him up. He's awesome. And we're going to talk about how awesome he is and that the Bigfoot costume and specifically the, the mask or the prosthetic, just animatronic wonder that is the Bigfoot's face, uh, was done by Rick Baker, the legendary Rick Baker. And I, I want to start off positively with this episode. And I, I want to celebrate the work of Kevin Peter Hall and Rick Baker in Harry and the Hendersons because they are potentially one of the few things worth celebrating about this movie. Sure. Harry and the Hendersons was written and directed by a guy named William Deere. Uh, and then there's another another two writers, a guy named Bill Martin and a guy named uh, Ezra Rappaport that worked on the script as well. And uh, this is produced under the Amblin banner. So Spielberg had some tangential involvement with this film. And um, when we start off, the film it pr it makes it pretty apparent that it wants to cut to the Bigfoot stuff really quick. You know, this was the Bigfoot movie. And I think, you know, Amblin Pictures like to do this thing, you know, often being on the front line of effects filmmaking, you know, particularly as it appeals to, appeals to children. It's like, OK, if we can be the definitive dinosaur movie where dinosaurs appear to come to life, kids will show up in fucking droves. And they did. And that movie was Jurassic Park. If a movie could make Bigfoot come to life for children. It could be a pretty, uh, it could be a pretty huge success if it, if it played its cards right. And the Bigfoot creature in this film, again, played by the wonderful Kevin Peter Hall with effects by the legendary Rick Baker is far and away the best thing about the film. It's incredible. 
it's it's jaw dropping. I mean, literally, there were so many moments during our screening where Travis and I were we we were gobsmacked by how good this creature and and the performance that's being done in it. It, it, it it's incredible, and we will definitely pick some I think specific moments as we as we attempt to go through the plot of this movie. Mm-hmm. But you you talk about the opening, and I do want to say that the opening is a very Spielberg opening. It's the opening to Jaws. It is a creature POV shot. Yeah. Well, it appears to be like several several POVs sort of cross-cut in the forest, and the score is very apparent very immediately, so you know it feels <laughs> very Spielberg-y, feels very Amblin-y. It's by Bruce Broughton, who's done scores for a couple of movies that we've reviewed on the show. He definitely did the Lost in Space score. I forget what else he's done, but he's done a couple other scores for for movies we've talked about. But anyway, he's not a bad composer, and I think the the music in the film is not poorly composed. But woo boy, um, it just never stops. It's the needle never leaves the groove. It it is it is a constant score, and when it finally relents at certain points in the movie, it's like oh, woo, you know, you feel finally like you can breathe. Yeah. So so in this opening. We are very quickly introduced to the Henderson family, specifically George Henderson, uh, played by John Lithgow, who's the father who is catching a recently, uh, immediately killed rabbit uh, that his son, Ernie Henderson, played by Joshua Rudoy, has killed. They're out on this camping trip. They seem to be very outdoorsy as far as John Lithgow and his son are concerned. But then the wife, Nancy, played by Melinda Dillon, and the daughter, Sarah, played by Margaret Langrick, uh, they're kind of not really about it. And they all pack in the car to leave because I guess this is the end of their camping trip. Like Ernie has killed a rabbit and they're leaving. And as soon as they get on the road, they hit a Bigfoot. Yep. They just smack right into that motherfucker with their big vacation mobile. And... um there is this rather extended scene where John Lithgow is trying to figure out, you know, what's, you know, what has been smacked by their car up in the road ahead. And, um, eventually they decide to take this big creature, uh, and strap it to the roof of their car. Uh, and if you think, well, that's stupid. Where do you see the rest of the movie folks? So there is a, a, a piece of debris left behind by this impact. Um, the license plate on the front of their vehicle gets whacked, pretty hard by Sasquatch's shin, I guess. Uh, And it leaves a big dent and the license plate falls off. Uh, They suffer some pretty severe damage to their front fender. Uh, And there's a big clump of hair left on that license plate. And as the Hendersons drive away, there's this dude that appears, you know, walking through the forest with a gun. And immediately the language of the filmmaking is telling us that this is the bad guy. The score is telling us this is the bad guy. The lighting is telling us that this is the bad guy. The way he's shot, the kind of mood. We know this is the villain. This is the Bigfoot hunter who is going to find our poor vegan Bigfoot. Well, he's not vegan. He's, he's not vegan. He's, he's pescatarian. Here, I, I want to, because one of the things we're going to talk about in this episode is, is structure. And there is a great, I think this is a really good movie to use as an example of how one aspect of your movie can be working really, really well but it is undercut by another crucial aspect of the movie. In this case, it is the script. And and it, it happens here in the opening. They hit Bigfoot and they're looking at him. And the direction here and the choice of how to reveal the monster is good. It is, we don't see Bigfoot's face. He's slumped over. We see he's just a big mound of fur at first. Then we get another shot where it's like, okay, now we can kind of see the shape of him. Of course, we see his big feet. Um, yeah, yeah, his trademark feet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you got to show those. Um, so they 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 tie him up to the top of the the car, and the shot where it's you know outside, like you know looking uh, in, into the car from the front hood with the Bigfoot on the tarp above. It's like, oh, I, I can kind of see a little bit of his face now. And then they're talking, and they're like, yeah, he's definitely dead. Yada yada yada. And then the Bigfoot comes to life and screams into the windshield. Great shot. Great reveal. Yeah. Well, well, and and he screams into it. They go, rah, Lithgow hits the brakes and the Bigfoot goes flying off the front of the car. The shot of this motherfucker rocketing off the front of the car, by the way, 
is nothing short of hilarious because they got they got the exact shot they needed of this thing. I mean, like just uh, just going off the car and and hitting the road face first. And, you know, one of the immediate buy ins is like, OK, Bigfoot's been in, you know, he wasn't he's been in two car accidents, basically in a row. And he's not hurt, but he is in a coma. Well, he, here's where I want to make <laughs> here's where I want to make my point direction wise. This all works like the the setup of the shots, the pacing of the scene, the edit and everything. It is working, but the script is undercutting it because, like you just said, we essentially experience the same scene twice. Yeah. In terms of the structure, it like they hit Bigfoot, they tie him up on the top of their car because they're like, we found Bigfoot. This could be, you know, real, we could make a ton of money. Let's take him back home. That should have been it. That should have been like structurally writing wise. That's it. But they repeat the same scene again with Bigfoot screaming and flying off. And again, Gen- John <laughs> Lithgow has to walk up to it and be like, oh, is it dead? I got to poke it again. Yeah. I mean, they could have cut these two scenes together at that point because essentially the, the filmmaking language is almost exactly the same as Bigfoot is laying in the road unconscious. But like I, I, another thing that's really frustrating about this sort of repeated scenes is that at this point, the movie has been through about 40 attempts at jokes and none of them have landed. This is one of the unfunniest family comedies I've seen in years. It is painful. Now, we need to clarify something. I agree with you, but I am willing to chalk that up to a more of an us problem because... We're in our 30s, yes. Well, well, no. Harry and the Hendersons did eventually become a multicam laugh track American sitcom. And that is a type of humor that you and I have zero interest or engagement with yeah uh if you all don't know both drew and i have like no love for american multicam sitcoms nothing we don't like, we don't like frazier we don't like seinfeld no nope. you know, it no uh nope and, and i know there's, about there's gonna i know that's very controversial because there's always gonna be like yeah but what about this one nothing like there's just no real interest from us and that's why i'm willing to give a little bit of the benefit of the doubt to harry and the hendersons because As far as the construction, that is the kind of humor that I feel is so rampant in this movie to the point where I told you, I was like, it feels like there is an invisible laugh track in this movie. That's how structured the jokes are. Yeah. And it's crazy to think that like they made 72 episodes of this multicam sitcom. And it had like it had like a decent cast. Bruce Davison plays the John Lithgow role in the sitcom. They brought Kevin Peter Hall back. They bought the they brought the fully articulated suit back. And you know, in this time, it had to work in wide shots because it was all multicam sitcom. And you know, it's it, it's really impressive in that regard that they could have this giant monster on set. You know, for like a span of two years, while they made seventy two episodes of this of this sitcom. That's just insane to me. But yeah, you're right in that the the movie feels so achingly like a multicam sitcom and it's in the kinds of jokes, it's in the kinds of the setup of the premise and this is what the movie considers to be its first act. And, you know, bringing this back to structure and our one of one of our main criticisms about this is like it's wholly inadequate as a setup for the story because things like this happen when someone is pushing to make a plot beat land by the 15 minute mark. And they're thinking, okay, the main sort of marquee value of this movie is like, it's Bigfoot at home. You know, what happens if you bring Bigfoot into your home? Kooky hijinks ensue. Like that's the thing that needs to happen by the 15 minute mark. If if at 15 minute marks, Bigfoot's not home, heads will roll. And this is the kind of silly arbitrary bullshit that forces scripts like this into like weird you know, stunted first acts where like no character is established and there's literally nothing laid out ahead for the, for the, for the movie to go on as far as tracks. Well, here, here, here's the thing. I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate a little bit here because I, I, you know, I agree with you because we had, we had the same experience watching this, but there is a part where it's like, I get, I get, it's like, okay, you want to get into the thick of it as soon as you can, because if you're, if you're waiting around for 30 minutes and people haven't seen big, uh, haven't had the, the presence of Bigfoot in some way, they're going to feel like they've been slighted. Now, I think there's a way for that to work in this movie. The problem is that the establishment of the family, of the Hendersons, is is 
painfully one note and it's it it's like a half note at that well and it it just boggles my mind the running time for this movie is an hour and 50 minutes an hour and 50 minutes it's only 10 minutes shy of two hours and they could have done much more i feel like with with within 90 minutes or less well there's a reason i believe for that and it's it comes around to structure and we're gonna have to jump around here because there are a bunch of things that we get introduced to in the second act of the movie, and I want to say in like the second half of the second act. It really almost reads like a four-act movie by the time you're done with it. Well, the things that we get introduced to are textbook first act things. Mm -hmm. It is setting up so much of, because eventually we realize that this is going to be John Lithgow's movie. And we're going to talk about John Lithgow because this is John Lithgow month in a bit. But the movie isn't really John Lithgow's movie until the second act kind of I, I, I don't even, I think you're right. I think it's really the third act where it kicks in, where it's like, oh, this is who this character is. Why didn't we see this before? Right. Because the first act is like, we're out in the woods. We ran into Bigfoot. We got to bring him home. Then the second act is Bigfoot's in our home. How do we hide that Bigfoot's in our home? Mm-hmm. The third act is when we finally get around to, well, who is George Henderson, really? We get these little bits and pieces about him. Like, okay, he's an out, he's an outdoorsy type and all that, but it's not it's not character. Right. It's it's dressing. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, at, let's say for, you know, for posterity's sake, it's like, okay, um act breaks are sort of nebulous and ill-defined. Really what I look at as an act break or the most the most serious act breaks in movies are Okay, at what point is the premise set up and we can now continue forward? And for me, it's at that 50, it's usually at that 15 minute mark where it's like, okay, the premise has been achieved. Bigfoot is home. Now let's move forward from here. And then at the end of the second act, the characters have reached their lowest point. Nothing has ever been worse for these characters. Well, th- this is in typical three act structure. Right. This, this is what we consider to be typical three act structure in films. There is also usually at the center of the film, at the half point, a, a turning point in the middle of the second act. The second act is the bulk of the movie. It's most of the movie in, in three act structure. So um, this is all arbitrary. Just take it with a grain of salt. But any, anyways, um, what I feel like, you know, tends to happen in movies where they, they tend to push, you know, getting to what people want to see to the 15 minute mark. It's like, well, if you had actually held off on hitting Bigfoot with the car until 15 minutes, instead of, you know, setting the goal of getting it home, you could have established that these people are actually human beings with things that they want and like family connections and like a, a, a daily life instead of just, you know, coming upon them in the woods. And what the movie lays out is the main arc for these characters are like, they're a whole bunch of miserable assholes who don't value the wilderness and Bigfoot is going to teach them a lesson. And, you know, early on in this movie, all these characters are really unpleasant to be around. The kid, the little kid is a shithead. The teenage girl is a miserable shithead. The dad is a, well, you know, like a outdoorsy shithead who thinks he can exploit uh, Bigfoot for money and wants to shoot him with a big gun. Bang, bang. And then the wife is just around. It sucks. It sucks. The wife is just a sounding board to kind of nag John Lithgow um, all the time. Um, I guess. It, which is really funny. Uh, not intentionally. But it's why, I, why I agree with your four-act structure, because the way I look at act breaks, because it is a nebulous thing that can, be easily, that can be defined by anybody, is an act break happens when a character makes a, a choice that they pretty much cannot turn back from. Yes. Yeah. Where, where, and, and to me, the four choices are, we hit Bigfoot, let's take him home to get money. Then it's like, oh, no, we have Bigfoot here and he's romping about. We have to hide him. The third act break for John Lithgow is when he realizes, you know what? I kind of like this Bigfoot. Right. And maybe people don't aren't getting him like they, they don't get him. And then the fourth act ends up being we got I got to take Bigfoot back home. So there, there is a moment where like Bigfoot breaks out and, you know, is running amok. But we'll get there. Like there, there is a turning point where they bring Bigfoot home. And of course, he's like. Running the muck and running the muck in the house and like busting up all their lintels and like I don't know tearing up their floorboards and shit, but breaking open their fridge and there's some actual fun Bigfoot in the house stuff. And again, most of it I can lay at the big feet of Kevin 
Peter or Peter Kevin. I've lost the Kevin, Kevin Peter, Peter Hall. Hall. Here's the thing. If it is not clear, we did not like this movie. Oh, it sucks. It's real bad. Hardly at all. But when this movie decides to showcase Harry's face and it is not just Harry's face, it is Kevin Peter Hall's eyes. Mm. Now, here's the thing. Kevin Peter Hall being a very tall and very um, lanky individual. It's like, well, it makes sense that he plays these, you know, characters and suits and stuff that have to be really big and imposing and everything. Uh, but as an actor, one of your crucial tools, especially in film acting, are your eyes. Yes. This movie is so incredible to me for showcasing that aspect of acting because the Rick Baker animatronic fate, it, the, the articulation on this thing and all the things that it can do are, are still incredible to me. Like it's, it's one of the greatest movie effects I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I will completely give it to that, but as amazing technically as it is, it is nothing without the eyes of Kevin Peter Hall, because when they show this Bigfoot giving you the biggest, dumbest, silliest grin or screaming when it's, trying to, you know, be imposing or laughing like an idiot at something on the television, <laughs> uh, laughing at bedtime for Bonzo, yeah. watching bedtime for Bonzo. It is because Kevin Peter Hall's eyes sell the emotion in every shot. It's, it's, gen- it, it is almost worth giving the movie merits because it's like, it's that good. It is. And, you know, there's, there are small cutouts in the overall, you know, articulated Sasquatch face. And so hit the brows and the, you know, the area around the cheekbones and the sort of musculature, that's all articulated, you know, puppeteered by people with remote controls out, out, out of the frame. The actual eyes themselves are Kevin Peter Hall's eyes. He's wearing contact lenses. Kevin Peter Hall's a black man. His eyes are brown, um, but they gave him big blue contacts for this. And... What is amazing is that that synchronization of Kevin Peter Hall as a performer in the suit, his body language, eye movement, um, combined with the incredible uh, puppetry of this as as an effect. It's like, God damn, like it's all working together so well. And those moments where they actually want you to like Bigfoot, they work. You know, there is this moment where John Lithgow's character has a a rifle and he's going to shoot Bigfoot in the face and Bigfoot comes upstairs and is looking at, um, I forget, he looks at a family photo or something like that. Um, and I don't remember spe- specifically what it was, but... You see a moment of vulnerability in silhouette, and the body yes. language sells it all. That that alone, like, I'm, I'm giving all this praise about Kevin Peter Hall's eyes, but with nothing but the silhouette of the Bigfoot, there is a shot, and, and credit to William Deere, like, mm-hmm. and, 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 and... and and the cinematographer, whose name I do not have pulled up right now, but I'm sure as I'm saying it, that both Travis and I are trying to get it pulled up so that we can give this person the credit that they deserve. Alan Davio. Yeah. Alan Davio. This shot of Bigfoot, uh, who say, you know, this is the same person that shot E.T., and this is very clearly an E.T. ripoff from the people that made E.T., essentially. Yep. Amblin. This shot of the Bigfoot in silhouette as it looks at this family photo. I can't, I can't remember exactly what it is it's looking at, but it starts to turn towards the window. And both Travis and I were like, this is, oh my gosh, like uh, removed from the context of the movie, this is working like gangbusters. Right. It's these moments where you're like, oh, I'm sold on the concept. Like they did turn Bigfoot into this like big lovable glute who can emote better. I loved him. I, I said in that moment, I was like, I was like, oh no, I love him. Yeah, (laughs) it's true because I did not like the movie, but I liked Bigfoot. And so, you know, John Lithgow's character through his um, gun scope, you actually see Bigfoot's face in the fucking crosshairs, which is hilarious. Um, He realizes that this thing, you know, is is more emotionally, probably more emotionally intelligent than he is. Uh, And so he decides in that moment not to shoot it. And so at this point, they have this whole like, okay, what are we going to do to keep a Bigfoot in our house? And the next big plot point after that is uh, uh, Bigfoot escaping. There is a, a, an attempt. They try to lure him back into the station wagon so they can take him back out to the woods. Uh, I am very surprised they did not get the McDonald's money for this scene where they try to lure him in with like filet fish and fucking French fries. No, no. 
Mac, Mac and me had taken all that by that point. Yeah, there was none left. Yeah, which, which I mean, you and I ain't even said this. This has Mac and me vibes, which again, it is an ET ripoff. It is this is a boy and his dog movie, which is what ET is, I and mean, you know, it is it is that kind of thing. Yeah, too bad the boy is like nails on a chalkboard. Bad here. Well, well, the boy is not the boy in this. The boy is John Lithgow. Yeah, and and we don't learn that until like the third act of the movie. Uh, we need to talk about John Lithgow because this is you know Lithgowing Lithgow on month, and Lithgow does not get the chance to be John Lithgow until like the back fourth of this movie. Yeah, we find out like what he actually does in his life. Like he actually is a real you know becomes a real character at that point. Where we find out it's like. Oh, he's he's got his family business where his dad is played by uh, M. Emmett Walsh, who we love to see in movies. God, yes. And M. Emmett Walsh's character runs like an outdoors store, like a gun store. Um, and John Lithgow's character works there, clearly doesn't enjoy working there. And then we figure we figure out that John Lithgow is actually he's a very talented illustrator. And, you know, the Bigfoot being at home sparks this like want for him to like start drawing again and his dad thinks the drawing again is silly because he want the dad would rather see like oh draw bigfoot as a big scary monster that we can use on targets for you know yay who's to shoot at and no uh lithgow is you know the uh, awakening of a sensitive soy boy artist because bigfoot the inspirational bigfoot is the biggest soy boy in the pacific northwest well he- here's the thing is that this stuff would like you know not having dad approval this is all textbook stuff, but it's supposed to happen in the first act when you're setting up your characters. It doesn't happen in this movie until the third act. And there were so many scenes when we were watching it where like John Lithgow is is in a like break room with some of his coworkers who are really like, Did you hear about that Bigfoot? I heard they're this big and stuff. And you're like, This is a first act scene. Yes. In, in yes, totality. Yes. Like it's like we it gives us an insight into who this character is, what their wants, their desires, their their hang ups, all this kind of stuff. And it's it's like over halfway through the movie almost. And yeah, there seems to be like two conflicting major arcs for John Lithgow's characters. You know, and the the beginning sets it up like, oh, all these characters are assholes and inviting Bigfoot into their lives is actually going to make them better. And while that does happen, I feel like the more compelling story is like. John Lithgow is this sensitive artist type who's forced to work at his father's outdoor store, which he doesn't really like. And then, you know, Bigfoot bringing Bigfoot into his life is this awakening of like this other side that he needs to foster in himself that'll allow him to be more emotionally truthful with his wife and all this sort of stuff. Like that's a way more intricate and nice story, like a better story for a movie. And yet the movie doesn't actually introduce it until the halfway point. Well, it's it also better emphasizes the theme of compassion because Bigfoot is a compassionate creature. He does not eat you know red meat he only eats fish we see him eat one fish in the movie and then like a fish sandwich so he's a pescatarian but otherwise when he gets to the house he sees that you know they have a a deer head up on the wall and he's like you know trying to pat behind it like where's the, where's the rest of it where and he are wants my to forest be- friends you yeah, he killed wa- and he, skinned he, all my forest friends he takes grandma's mink stole and buries it in the garden Right, which eventually leads to this. It's like, oh, they real like John Lithgow realizes like he doesn't like the animals, and then they you know look around. It's like we have tons of mounted animal heads. We have to hide them in a closet, which which comes around way too late in the movie. And so the idea is like, okay, yes, like Bigfoot will help enrich their lives, and it will help John Lithgow to realize that he has actually been that all of this outdoorsy gun nut like kill animal stuff, which is how we're introduced to him, was all posturing for him, mm-hmm. like. That, that's that's a good story, but structurally it doesn't pay off because we don't get that sense of the character until the movie's over halfway over. Like, right. Like, it, it's, it is such poor structuring and such a simple fix, it seems like. And it's unfortunate because John Lithgow in that back half actually gets to start really – like in that first half or so, I had said during our screen, it's like this part could have been played by any – like bland white guy, eighties actor, dad type, anybody mother like, it's fucker. I am sorry. I have to interrupt you, but do you know who is credited in the art department on IMDb, but it says uncredited next to their name. I don't know. Scream mad, George crit killing crit killing. Oh, no way. <laughs> crit killing throwback oh. all the way to our jaws of revenge episode where crit killing was the effects guy that constructed that <laughs> Horrible alternate ending for Jaws of Revenge. Anyway, back to uh, John Lithgow. Yes, you are totally correct. The character as portrayed and as written in this movie could have been played by fucking anybody. 
uh, it really demands so little of Lithgow as a performer. And that's disappointing to see because Lithgow is a fantastic performer. We want to see him used to his full potential. And in this movie, ugh. it peeks through in the back half when he has not only decided that he likes Bigfoot, but he's going to publicly defend him, whether it's to his dad or eventually he's he's out looking for Bigfoot. And there's this biker who said like, yeah, the big creature, because everybody's seen the Bigfoot around. He's like, it knocked into me and threw me in and broke my arm. And John Lithgow is just like, it's bullshit. Like, and, and he calls him out on on television while these people are interviewing him. and there and John Lithgow gets to make John Lithgow faces. And we love John Lithgow faces like he gets really mad. He, John Lithgow's a great mugger. Arrest him for mugging. He's guilty. Yeah, f- fantastic. Like, and it's good. And <laughs> there are just moments in the, like, I'm sorry, I'm skipping ahead, but. He has to do the, you know, yell at your dog to go away, but it's the best thing for the dog moment, which is in a lot of boy and his dog stories. I hate you. Um, Get out yeah, of here. Exactly. And, and and he has to do that at the end. And it's it's like, yay, John Lithgow has life in him. Yeah. He actually punches Bigfoot to get him to walk away. <laughs> it's incredible. It, he, even though, even he, though Bigfoot's family is evidently right there. Oh yeah, yeah. They all watched this like, ooh. Um, <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> World star. <laughs> World star. Um you know, I thought I was gonna have more to say about this movie, but it it's a it's a huge disappointment. I mean, it it's it's aggressively bad specifically to a lot of our taste. Like we say, this the the humor, there's very, very, very few moments that actually made us laugh. And some of them I think were unintentional, like John Lithgow closed fist punching Bigfoot in this big fucking face. Looking like he's about like trying not to kiss him basically, you know. Oh yeah, well that <laughs> I wish I could quit you, Bigfoot. Yeah. <laughs> so it's rubbing rubbing Bigfoot's jacket at the end of the movie. There is more to talk about here. And I want to talk about a certain point in the movie where you and I were not looking at the running time. And, you know, there is this point where, you know, Bigfoot is lost in the big city and they're trying to find him. But the Bigfoot hunter, the weird French Canadian guy who picked up the license plate at the beginning of the movie, he's out there and he's trying to kill Bigfoot. And oh, my God, police are running around. Yeah, the cops are running around. Um, uh, There's been a scene where like Bigfoot's like howling in the city. And we think like this is the darkest night of the soul for these characters. They have to find each other. Lithgow's just sick with worry about Bigfoot. Bigfoot's miserable out there in the streets. He's trying to find home. And they defeat the fucking French um, Bigfoot hunter and they're able to bring Bigfoot back home. And you think, yay. All right. Well, that was kind of, you know, it was a climax. Um, They do this insane effect where they put the they put Bigfoot and the Bigfoot hunter in a dumpster that's being picked up by a, a, a trash truck. And they rocket this dumpster off the front of this truck. And you can actually see the effect in the in there. They put a whole bunch of air rams on it. So you can see the compressed air jet out of the bottom as it rockets across the screen. Big effect. Very crowd pleasing. Uh, And I thought for sure, like, all right, this was not a pleasant movie, but at least it's over now. We were wrong. We were off by a half hour. Yeah, I had to reveal. I, I said to you, like, how is there thirty minutes left in this movie? And and you, rightfully so, went what? Yeah, I said, like, fuck off. Yeah, and and it's because in the, it's like okay, the the Bigfoot has escaped the clutches of the evil hunter and and the police and is back with Harry and everything's cool. Lithgow has become a better man. Like we we right. get it at this point. Yeah, they they they've become vegetarians in their home. Um, some days and. For some yeah, guests. some days. Yeah, for some guests. Um, and it's like, okay, this feels like a thing. And then there's 30 minutes left, and you're like, what, 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 what? Yeah. What else is going to go on? And then it turns out, like, well, there's this other Bigfoot scientist played by Don Amici. And Don Amici's great. Like, sure. I you know, love, love seeing him pop. Great voice. Um, and it's like, well, they're going to have him come to the house and reveal that Bigfoot's there. Uh, we are convinced that he fucks Bigfoot in the movie. Oh um, man, there is this moment where like Don Amici comes over, they invite him over, you know, he's been he's this disgraced Bigfoot scientist who's quite bitter about this and so the the family, the central family, the Henderson surprise him by, you know, showing him, "Oh my god, Bigfoot is real." And so after their dinner party with Bigfoot, um Bigfoot like huddles down and like grabs a bunch of pine boughs and puts them in a corner and that's his bed where he's going to sleep. And you know, Don Amici leaves. And we're like, "Okay, all right, 
He's done. And then he comes back in with his sleeping bag and rolls it right down next to Bigfoot. I'm like, he is bunking with Bigfoot, yo. He's right up next to him. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. They're going to sleep face to face. They're And they, they wake up with the dog on them and all that kind of stuff. It's like, this, these are a couple now. They're a couple. Well, the thing is, like, right after that, right after he throws the sleeping bag, it's like, I mean, in Bigfoot space, cut to morning. I'm like, look, I, I refuse to believe that they didn't fuck. Like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I yeah. Like there there's nothing you can't disprove that they didn't fuck. Yeah. Um you know what's you know what's also kind of strange about this is like this is the one movie I've seen and I've seen a lot of movies bear in mind. This is the one movie I've seen that actually really needed a shot of Bigfoot's nuts. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned that before. There's a moment where they're not sure what sex the Bigfoot is and um only person who's confident in the sex of the Bigfoot is the teenage daughter. And they're like, how can you tell? And she's like, trust me. And I'm like, what? Sh- uh, what? No, come on. Y- you gotta, sh- you gotta let us know, like show us Bigfoot sack or something. <laughs> it's just, please. I mean, <sighs> give me something enjoyable about this movie. The the rest of this movie, then it just becomes like, all right, we got to get Bigfoot back to the forest before the hunter gets out of prison and mm-hmm. comes and gets him. Got a free willy. And- yeah, there, there's Bigfoot somehow has learned how to imitate a police siren while they're on the road. They get stuck in traffic and he leans his big Rick Baker head out the window and starts screaming. But it sounds like a police siren. So all the cars part. It is a sincerely bizarre moment. It um, just it's a real stupid movie. But that is like one of the stupid, stupidest moments in it. It's it's um impressively it, stupid. Yeah, it, it's so stupid that I give it props. It's like, I you know. I don't know that they, they they set up that like Bigfoot makes a bunch of different kinds of noises like he'll coo and he, he can laugh and stuff. So it's like, OK, oh, his and, laugh, his laugh when he's watching TV, we said it sounded just like um, the laugh at the beginning of Feel Good Inc. by Gorillaz. Yes, it does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Feel good. And well, and, and event, you know, spoiler alert, like we eventually learned that the, the, the Bigfoots have a language. That they can talk. He says, like, okay, okay. So, I, you know, whatever. I guess it can also imitate police sirens perfectly to the point that everybody in traffic believes it's a police car. Um, Where's Bigfoot hanging out that he knows how to pol- imitate police sirens? He, he, they get rid of Bigfoot. Like, like that's the movie. And yeah. even then, like, the ending of it, it's, it's, it's total Return of the King style where you're like, how is this not ended yet? Like, yeah. It, how many times can the score swell? Exactly. And it's like, okay, yeah, the score is swelling. Let's cut to black. Let's like, uh, huh? Okay, the score is swelling going. again. Let's cut to black. Oh, Jesus Christ. Big, big, Bigfoot's, walk, Bigfoot's walking away. All right, he's walking away. Cut, you know, fade to black. No, no, no. Let's have another scene with Don Amici and, and, and the French Bigfoot hunter to talk about what they're talking about. It's like, oh, my God, please end. Like, it, it was painful at that point. Yeah. Yeah, this movie sucks real bad. I'm never going to watch it again. And <laughs> like you, yeah, one of the most important things you said in our conversation about it when we were talking about it at first is like this movie needed Joe Dante. And you're absolutely right. You know, while um, I think William Deere, as far as as far as a technical you know director goes, is like, yeah, this movie is directed more than adequately on the technical side. It, you know, close ups are nice. Lighting is beautiful. It, the edit is pretty good, although I think, you know, maybe could have been shortened a bit. Like scene to scene transitions feel good, um, but boy, uh, is this a weak, weak script? Woof. I mean, I, you know, obviously we talk about this all the time. Whatever the credited names are, who knows who did uncredited rewrites and punch ups and stuff on this? But the script, as seen in the movie, mm-hmm. is tragic. Like I think it's a genuine tragedy because the. The performance of Kevin Peter Hall and the effects by Rick Baker and his team and everything that that culminates into, that performance and that creature deserve a better movie. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, this was popular enough. You know, It wasn't super popular when it hit theaters in 87. I think it opened at number three in the uh, U.S. box office. Not hugely impressive. Uh, yeah, it was number three or number four underneath uh, The Untouchables. Um, yeah. <laughs> th- this, this had a reported budget of $10 million and made about $20 million domestic and then another... I believe 20 million uh, internationally. So it was certainly a success, but it was, I mean, it's clear that this was, if you look at the marketing material and everything, they wanted this to be the next ET. And much like ET, they did not showcase uh, 
the Bigfoot in a lot of the American uh, domestic marketing. Right. So it was right. like, you know, you got you got to go to the movie to see what the Bigfoot looks like. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas when they marketed it overseas, it was called Bigfoot and the Hendersons and Bigfoot was in every fucking poster. Exactly. <laughs> um, just, just crazy. Well, I think I think they figured that out potentially was. Yeah. That yeah. We should have put Bigfoot on everything. And if people saw how good this puppet was just from a cursory thing, they'd be like, wow, that looks, that's a really, I mean, I, 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 I have no qualms about saying this is the best Bigfoot I've ever seen in a movie. It is the best Bigfoot on film. There's no question. Um, uh, it's a shame that it's like stuck in this and it's stuck in this shitty movie. It is. Oof. And, 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 you know, as far as, yeah, I mean, it, it almost makes sense that after the wild, unimaginable high that we had from last week's episode on ricochet we we had to i mean we did not plan for this to be this low of a low but it's a it's it's a definite low and it's a bummer for john lithgow um who's totally wasted in this movie totally wasted he really is and it's a bummer because he's still it's not like he's bad in the movie uh -uh. it's just there is very little for him to work with as far as elevating. And like I say, there's just not a lot of things in the script that play to his particular strengths. No. So I, you know, it, it's a, it's a bummer for, for, for the month, um, uh, for the month of John Lithgow movies, but it's a really, really good Bigfoot. Got to give it that at least. And that, you know, it's, that's performer and the people that, you know, brought the actual effect yep. uh, to life. So if, if nothing else, it's, it's good for that. Uh, so yeah, I think now we can head over to the shelf where we pick a movie that acts as a good pairing, or in this case, substitute for our main topic. And we encourage you loyal listener to go to genrevision.com, comment on the post for this episode with your own shelf pick, and we will feature it on next week's episode. Travis, what are you going to pull off the shelf for Harry and the Hendersons? Uh, I just rewatched this and its sequel on New Year's Day because um, they're good movies. And our friend Deanna Chapman had recently covered them on Welcome to Geekdom. I'd you know, seen them before, loved them. Um, the movie I'm featuring today is Paddington. And Paddington is a movie that features a very similar premise to Harry and the Hendersons. Uh, but it does everything right. <laughs> so you know, the first 15 minutes of Paddington are establishing Paddington from his youth and talking about like, who is this character from the start and what does he enjoy and why, and what are his sort of family connections like, and where does he come from? And, um, what kind of tragedies have molded him as a character? All that is done gorgeously in the first 15 minutes of the movie before he even gets to Britain. And then once he gets to Britain, he meets this family that takes him in and then we meet them and we each learn their kind of, you know, we learn their quirks and Paddington does this really beautifully by uh, Paddington's observations of the family and writing letters to his aunt Lucy. And this serves as a really beautiful framing device. And this movie is done almost in sort of a Wes Anderson style of looking at characters as if they exist sort of in a dollhouse where it's able to frame characters in a context where it's like, okay, here's an easily understandable sort of little diorama that tells us a lot about this character and who they are. Um, you know, there's a lot of really good costuming choices in the movie that tell us who characters are. So it's, it's just so beautifully done. It's also tremendously funny. Um, this is a family film that just, I mean, it's got a great, like a legendary good fart joke in the first 15 minutes of the movie. Um, and, and you wouldn't think that from like this fairly, you know, proper little movie, you know, this, it's, you know, kind of British stiff upper lip humor. Um, Paddington is great. I, I'm, I, I'm willing to say like, I, I really didn't know what to think of this film when it was first coming out. Um, but years later, I think it's recognized now as sort of a new classic. And the sequel is um, just as good, if not better. It's awesome. So Paddington, you can learn a lot from watching as, uh, a movie as good as Paddington. Yeah, I got to see the second one at some point. I really like the first one. Oh, that's great. Uh, that's great. Uh, well, I was going to do another Boy and His Dog movie, but I figure I don't know if I'll ever have another opportunity to recommend another Bigfoot movie. Um, so I'm I'm – kind of breaking with tradition here a little bit, and I'm picking Boggy Creek 2 and The Legend Continues, but specifically the Mystery Science Theater 3000 version of that. Um, the first uh, Legend of Boggy Creek movie it's kind of, it was a, a very uh, famous, kind of, I, I don't know about famous, but a very uh, profitable movie. Yeah, big success. Yeah. Yep. Uh, it was shot in uh, Falk, Arkansas, and the majority of the people there are the people, the residents of Falca, Arkansas, who mm -hmm. are recounting their experiences seeing 
uh, this Sasquatch type uh, being. And then the film uses them in the recreations. And I think, I think it's a really groundbreaking film because you see that now is kind of the, the, the pattern for a lot of, you know, true crime shows and all that kind of stuff. That approach to doing that in filmmaking was kind of revolutionary for the first legend of boggy creek it is i mean watching that movie today it's pretty sleepy by today's standards but it's it's an interesting watch still yeah i mean i i I agree with that but part of the the joy of it is watching these actual uh you know i'm sorry to sound dismissive but yokels yeah um, yeah, uh uh-huh yeah you know from falk arkansas recounting their bigfoot stories and then getting to act them out um so that there there was a sequel made and the sequel is not nearly as interesting or good. It is pretty bad. But the Mystery Science Theater 3000, I, it might be in like my top five favorite Mystery Science Theater ones. Now, I know wow. that's very, I know that's very, you know, even more subjective than most things because it's like, well, it all depends on what Mystery Science Theater 3000s you've even seen mm. and when you saw them. Um, and that was certainly a formative one for me. Uh, but I, I I love it. There's tons of great jokes. It's It's a... It's a perfect, perfect MST3K target of a movie um, that I don't think ever – it doesn't get too mean-spirited because it is in that later period when they were on the sci-fi channel. Um, but it's – I mean even just thinking about it when we were picking our shelf picks, was, I was like, I that might be what I put on to go to sleep tonight because I really love that. So the Mystery Science Theater 3000 version of Boggy Creek 2 and The Legend Continues to be heard about from no one. Okay. So now we can head over to the listener shelf picks from last week's episode on Ricochet, uh, which we please go listen to that episode and just listen to the ebullient joy that we felt watching Ricochet. Uh, Mr. Milksteak had Fallen, the Denzel Washington film, and The First Power, which I have not seen, but I've heard about a lot. And maybe I got to check that out. Eric Fuchs went with Demolition Man, which is a great seal of approval as far as shelf picks go for a movie. Uh, JT went with Last Boy Scout, which I remember seeing and liking, but don't remember. I I think that's the movie that opens with Billy Blanks on a football field shooting somebody. And then never seen it, so I can't tell you. And I think and I think then he he says, ain't life a bitch and then shoots himself Um in the middle of this like rainy football game or football practice, wild opening. Uh, that's a, I believe that's a Shane Black movie. Uh, and then Steven Nespello went with Judgment Night, which is another movie I've heard about forever um, from the '90s, and I, I believe our uh, our good friend Ice T might be in that. Mm. So uh, you know that is always a a a worthy reason to pique our interest. Uh, so thank you so much, everybody, for the shelf picks. Love seeing those every week and very interested to see the ones for this one, considering our take on the movie. Uh, let's do some currently consuming. Travis, what's been on your plate? Well, a whole bunch, but uh, let's talk about um, something small, something I really enjoyed and something I know you would like. I don't know if you've seen it yet, but um, I, I'm a big fan of an animator named Felix Colgrave. Oh, yeah. I haven't watched that yet. Yeah. He had an animation, a short animation of his go um, pretty big on YouTube a few years ago, and it was called Double King. And it's great. It's wonderful. Um, he's evolved a lot as an animator. His earlier work was a lot more sort of chaotic and scrabbly and hand drawn. And he's kind of gotten a lot more into more clean, um, you know, sort of hallucinatory surrealism. Um, he just put out a new short that he's been working on for a couple of years called throat notes. And it's awesome. You know, it doesn't have as much of a plot as double King. It's more of an exploration of, um, the kind of wildlife where he lives. He's, he's in Australia and I think he's going over various creatures that live in Tasmania. And so you'll see certain, um, Australian critters you might recognize. And the little story that he kind of tells about them is, is kind of loose and vignette like, but, um, it's wonderful. The animation is just incredible. Uh, I will link to it in the show notes at genrevision.com. Uh, you can also just go to YouTube and look up throat notes, uh, Felix Colgrave, his last name is spelled C O L G R A V E Colgrave. Um, again, uh, double King and throat notes, both highly recommended. Some of his older stuff is fun too, but it's way weirder. Um, and, and comes from the mind of a, you know, a young white guy. So you might kind of imagine it's like a little more edgy. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but it's I think he's grown like his stuff has matured so beautifully. His sense of surrealist humor, like as told just in images and um, and music and sound effects, it's it's beautiful work. Uh, really, really fantastic animator up there with the likes I think of Don Hertzfeld. You know, totally different style, uh, but uh, definitely definitely worth a look for any of you. Yeah, I, I just pulled that up on YouTube. I'm going to watch that after we uh, after we wrap up here. Beautiful. Okay, uh, what's been on your plate? Well, something that I know you you've been watching, and I think you actually were part of recommending to me. Uh, this is Dimension Twenty. This is a series that is available on the College Humor streaming service Dropout, and I believe it's also available as a podcast. I know it's on. Some of it is on YouTube as well. Okay. Um, this is a a D and D show. Uh, which, if you listen to any of our pre show episodes, you'll know that we are <laughs> currently embroiled in a our first D and D campaign, um, which has been going on for a long time now, actually. Yep. Yeah. We're doing a lot of D and D talk over on this side. Yes. And, and this was recommended to me by you. And then, uh, one of, one of the people in our, our party and that person who was also DMing another campaign that I'm, that I'm a part of has said that this is kind of their biggest inspiration for how they approach Dungeons and Dragons and tabletop role playing. Uh, it is, the dungeon master is Brennan Lee Mulligan. Uh, this is all, you know, it's it's this college hu- uh, humor group of comedians uh, who I know a lot of them, I think, were part of the UCB. And it is, I, I'm, I'm going to say something controversial here. I think it might be my favorite exposure to Dungeons and Dragons, even more so than currently the Adventure Zone. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Adventure Zone doesn't really depict people playing the game in the same way and of course the guys in the adventure zone have a much uh different idea about the sincerity of playing the game and like what is and isn't happening in the diegesis of the story whereas roll 20 is all about that um and they do a really beautiful job of helping that story come to life with like miniature sets and miniature characters and that sort of stuff um that are available to the players uh to help them sort of flesh out where they are in combat scenes and things like that. It's, it's really beautiful work. It is. I mean, I, I love the, the structure of it basically will go like there will be a pretty heavy role play episode where they just have their main kind of display piece out in the middle of the table. And then the next episode will be a combat episode and they have, you know, varying maps and, and there are these beautiful uh, structures and, and everything um, that have wonderful revelations and all this kind of stuff. Uh, the first one I watched was the Arca Tiny Heist, which had the McElroys, uh, the entire McElroy clan, mm-hmm. uh, which was kind of it's like, OK, well, I, I've been listening to Taz and, and I've been enjoying it. And this seems like a good end. And I watched that and I, I adored that. It's even one where I'm like, I, I want to go back and watch that again. Um, I enjoyed that arc so much. Yeah, um, it's beautiful. And it's a, you know it's a fun approach where it's like well it's not Dungeons and Dragons fan stuff it's it's like a Toy Story D and D campaign essentially, um, and so I love that. And then I watched the next arc, which is called Escape from the Blood Keep, which is with all these higher level villain characters, and it's a really fun experiment with um, script flipping. It's essentially a script flip of Lord of the Rings. Yeah, and the inciting incident is the ring being destroyed. And the evil empire falling. <laughs> and so it's all these like, you know, sub villain characters, you know, deep in the, 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 uh, black tower, which is in this one, I forget exactly what they called it, but it's the blood keep in, in this. And, uh, now figuring out what they have to do now that the, the dark Lord is dead. <laughs> so uh, it's a pretty fun, pretty fun concept for a campaign. It's very, I mean, I, 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 I loved it. It's my favorite D and D thing I've been exposed to at this point. Um, I'm starting their next arc, which is, uh, well, I'm, I'm skipping around, uh, which maybe might not be the best thing to do, but I'm doing it because I'm, I'm kind of leaving the ones that seem to be the most beloved for last mm-hmm. and, uh, jumping around. Uh, the one I'm doing is called a crown of candy, which is like a big, I, I think of like adventure time, candy, whatever era, you know, a, a, a realm that that kind of stuff. It's like oh, everything's candy themed and food themed. Like the entire world is based around food. It's like oh, that's that. I, I like that. I like the idea of taking the mechanics of D and D and throwing them into non D and D worlds mm-hmm. um, and doing something really creative with the actual world. Like the escape from the Bloodkeep is essentially like yeah, it's your you know 
usual high fantasy D and D stuff. But the ones I'm the most interested in are the ones that aren't that. And and the majority, I mean, the first series I know called Fantasy High is like, what if you plunked a John Hughes movie into the middle of the D and D universe? And it's like, yeah, that's that's really fun and clever, and seems like it would lead to some really good improv. And and the people that I've seen, you know, they're very good at Im- improvisation and. You know, it, it's so enjoyable as somebody who's really, you know, very late as as far as for most people later in life, coming to tabletop role playing and and seeing the particular storytelling and and character joys that it brings. This has been the best introduction, in my opinion. I, I've certainly enjoyed the Adventure Zone, but this feels like the most accessible. I mean, I, I came to a primarily first from Harmon Quest. That might even be more accessible for more people because it's not like this show is holding the audience's hand as far as how D&D works. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I will say that, that you need to have some understanding, I think, of how D&D works because he's not going to tell, you know, Brennan doesn't sit here and say, okay, this is what a, a check is. Right, like, yeah. It, it, I think Adventure Zone in some ways, because it focuses less on the mechanics, may be a better introduction for some people. Yeah. But it's audio, and some people are going to have a hard time listening to a whole bunch of audio. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I think there's this term that Brennan Lee Mulligan has introduced to me, and that term is crunch. You know, when you're talking about D&D and something being crunchy, that means it's rife with rules and mechanics and numbers you have to understand and interpret like the stuff in uh you know for instance tiny heist is like okay they avoid a whole lot of the crunchier aspects of dungeons and dragons so they can pull off this shorter campaign and not have to worry about all the minutia of all these various things that they're doing so they they um you know, I think of a, a lot of hardcore D and D players who like the crunchier aspects of the of the game may find themselves not as interested. But if you like D and D as an opportunity for storytelling and not just an excuse to ex, you know exercise game mechanics, and I think it's it's wonderful. It's a fantastic experiment. Totally agree. So I I highly recommend Dimension Twenty if you have any interest in in this kind of stuff or trying to get into it. Um, I, I like again, I, I I would say if you can. Hunt down Harmon Quest. The first season of Harmon Quest is still like the, one of the, my favorite D and D things ever, if not mm-hmm. my favorite. But Dimension Twenty is thing. It's like I'm I'm locked into this. This is such a great exploration of this as comedy, as storytelling, as fantasy. It, it, it's wonderful. So Dimension Twenty, check that out. And we're gonna wrap things up with our comment of the week. And there's we we got so many good comments on Ricochet because we were so overjoyed with it and, and got to share that with y'all but we have to highlight this one from fergal cole Reeve, who said never seen ricochet but just ordered a secondhand dvd based on the conversation wow i can't i can't eat wow wow like we wow i mean hope here's the thing i don't know if any of that uh the record of that purchase will get back to warner brothers at all to let them know like hey put this out on blu-ray but bless you fergal colrevi for buying that movie yes absolutely es- especially on our recommendation that's that's wonderful okay i think that's all we got for today man um i just i just got some news uh, you know uh breaking across the wire here um godzilla versus kong was originally supposed to come out in may um, and they've kind of hammered out some details on how this is going to come out because it's a Warner Brothers film or at least being distributed by Warner Brothers. It's it's now um, uh, they've confirmed it was coming to HBO Max. There were some other things that they had to tie up for it. And it's going to be coming to HBO Max sooner uh, than it would have hit theaters originally. Uh, it is now coming out on March 26th. Uh, I, you know, I didn't like the last Godzilla movie. Uh, I'm not, you know, hugely enthusiastic. But if you all want to hear us review godzilla vs kong uh let us know yeah whoa okay sure yeah i mean if i can watch it at home yeah i'll review it <laughs> it'll be it'll be easier to watch from home it'll be easier to review you know i've got h i've got hbo max um as do i so yeah i, I was pleased with our hbo max streaming experience um you know around wonder woman 84 so yeah if you all want us to review that one we will um and it'll come out on march 26th so just leave a comment let us know what you want to do yeah let us know uh that's that's a good way to to cap things off here so and we'll we'll listen to what you say uh so let us know if you want us to review godzilla vs kong uh i don't know if that means i have to finish watching the second one which i bailed on (laughs) 
because I didn't like it. All you need to know is that Godzilla doesn't die at the end. There you go. Sure, that, I, explain, I, that would explain his appearance in the third film. I just know that Godzilla <laughs> will fight Kong. That's all. That's it. Um, so yeah, let us know, and uh, we'll be back next week with a non-Godzilla versus Kong movie. Uh, continuing uh, Lithgo and Lithgon month with Raising Cain. It's Lithgo and De Palma. It's got to be good, I love good, doing this show every week. We'll I see. love talking to you, buddy. I love uh, all you loyal listeners out there. We will be back next week with Raising Cain for, uh, for next week's episode. So as always, we want to thank you so much for listening. I'm Drew Deach. I'm Travis Newton. And we will see you next week right here on Genre Vision. Genre Vision.